Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today I have as my guest Andrea Petrone. He is an executive coach, a high performance coach, and he works with CEOs, CXOs and their team. And he's also a speaker. Andrea, please, can you give us 60 to 90 seconds on your background and how you ended up doing what you're doing? Thank you so much, first of all, Marcus, for inviting me to your podcast. I'm so happy to be here. I come from the corporate world, as many they do what I do right now. So I've been in the corporate world for 20 years. Interesting, I work in seven different countries in a very different roles, but most of these roles have been in leadership executive roles. So working with West Africa, North Africa, Middle East, uh, Scandinavia, my own country, Italy, and then I ended up to the UK in 2013. And uh, I primarily work in oil energy. That has been my, my main industry. And then I became a consultant. So I work in a consulting industry. And I learned a lot, as you can imagine, from different contexts, but also from a different leadership. And that actually that led me to think more about leadership. And current leadership, or the leadership I experienced, I don't think was good enough for what the society requires right now. So that is has been a major drive and say, you know what, well, I want to fight this mediocrity. And I decided to, to certify as executive coach. I went, you know, I, I did all my studies as necessary in the US. But then really I launched my practice early in 2019. And since then I really started working with the CEOs and executives and really to fight mediocrity, which that's exactly my main vision, because I do believe there is still a lot of mediocrity. And what I don't like really when I see people and leaders set up for average. And that's why I focus on high performance. Okay, so uh, I'm with you 100%. What passes for average in leadership and management is truly appalling. Not everywhere. And many people appear to have achieved management and leadership roles because they were good functionally or operationally in the thing that they were due to manage. However, if you read uh, Google's Project Oxygen information, it's clear that actually being able to do the job comes eighth in that hierarchy. And the number one is that the people in the team recommend joining that team to people they like and care about. So what is it that makes a great leader stand apart from mediocrity? That's such a great question. So what I think, Marcus, is so that many leaders became, became leaders, actually, by being very good functional managers, right? And in sales, for example, we've seen this so many times. Right? People that they get promoted as sales leader just because they were a great sales manager. But when they, when, when actually all that position as a sales leader, for example, they fail incredibly because they, they are not equipped from a leadership standpoint actually of managing things. So, but back to your point really is, for me, the great leaders are essentially people that are incredible, incredibly interesting to empower other people. That's really simple. Because it's empowering is all about leadership. Because when you are able to change your mindset and stop thinking about yourself and your ego and start really thinking about how I can empower others and make sure others can become the future leader in an organization. That's, in my opinion, what is really supposed to be done by a leader. That's one okay. thing. So what I'm hearing is that great leaders are great listeners, great observers, and they're talent spotters. And what they do is they identify the behaviors, skills, talents in others that most people would consider to be magic. But when the, you compliment the person about them, they're almost surprised because they think everybody can do that. Is that a fair observation? It's a fair observation. And it starts with one very important thing is actually you need to know your people inside out. And that for me is a big thing, Marcus, because I believe that many leaders, they say, you know what, well, I have a team and uh, as long as I know the team as an entity, it's good enough. It's not. It's actually how much you know every single people of your team. And we'll probably discuss a bit later, right, about motivation and actually other things. But you really need to know your people. And that is really something that leaders, they don't really spend enough time on. Just because they think they're too busy, right? 
And to me, that is one of the major failures when it comes to leadership. Well, they're often they're too busy because precisely they don't understand their people. If they did, then they'd be exactly. able to delegate. I don't know if you've read Liz Wiseman and Greg McEwen's book, Multipliers. In there, there's a fundamental premise that multipliers, people who spot talent and who empower others and give trust, are able to get 210% more than a diminishing leader who is a bottleneck. They're always the smartest in the room. They play the gotcha game. And as a result, they have a tendency to do what's called, uh, what I term rescuing, which is helping without boundaries or permission, or Correct. they're persecuting. And if they're persecuting, they punish people for taking risk and failing. And as a result, what they end up with is 50% productivity instead of 210% productivity. Yes, absolutely right. What you just shared is such an incredible point because I think it's, I mean, there have been a lot of studies about how important is actually trust in not only actually building great teams, uh, great leaders, future leaders, but also our trust, for example, is related to results, to the financial results organization. So that's another thing, Marcus, is, you know, I said just, you know, a few minutes ago about the importance of empowering people, but we, we shouldn't forget that leaders have one single, or not single, but one of the major goals is essentially bring your results to the organization. Because, you know, I don't believe to the leadership that says, yeah, you know, I want to be good with people. You know, I want to be very social. I want to be, you know, the best love leaders in my organization. Although that is important from a sociability standpoint, it's still super important to get results. Now, the good thing about trust is trust now is, you know, studied by, by many neuroscientists, actually, is how there is a, such a strong correlation between trust in organization and financial results. So, but when, when you actually lose trust in people, it's really everything falls apart, isn't it? Because without trust, there is no way to empower people, to delegate, as you said, to increase productivity, to boost their motivation, to get the most of the people, to increase performance. So there are so many undesired consequences, actually, of not having enough trust in your people. Well, this really begins with giving trust. And unfortunately, so often what you find is that many leaders have a command and control mentality. They're worried about losing control. And the grim reality is that by trying to maintain control, they lose it. And by giving it up, they gain it. So how do you get leaders to understand that paradox? That is one of the most challenging things. You have to look at their behaviors, first of all. Because I always say, here's the thing, Marcus, is I always say there is a triangle. If you imagine a triangle, right? So where the three peaks, if you like, there are ego, or let's say status, and then there is a result, and then there is a relationship, okay? So the best leaders, as you can imagine, they're just in the middle of that. So they're able to balance a good level of status, so not losing status, but not even become super egocentric. But also they're not over shifted, if you like, either to, to the result side or to the relationship. You have to be very balanced. So you need to be a good relationship with people, but keeping your status, protecting that. Focus on results, but at the same time, not, take, you know, not putting the results on top of everything else and disregard your status, but also your relationship. If you think about these three elements, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for leaders able to really be in the middle of that. But as I said, there is a behavioral change that is actually needed for people. They don't get most of the time. I'm sure yeah, that's your experience too, Marcus. Is when people they get promoted to an executive role to a leadership role. Unfortunately, that's when the testosterone starts to increase, and that is when their ego as well starts to increase. That is challenging. Because many people they don't realize that they don't realize that that is getting their way to become a better leader with others. They think that they reach already the status, and that also is the time when they start to be complacent. And when you get complacency, then you start looking at what is happening around you. Well, 
you either get complacent or you start to apportion blame and uh, yes. you punish. And what that does is it stifles risk taking. People won't put their head above the parapet. And as a result, what you end up with is a homogenized team of people who tell you what you want to hear. You only have to look at the last president and the amount of time people spent sanitizing the message so that he heard what he wanted to hear. Um, Correct. And that's very, very dangerous. And I think it's also really key that the leader understands that their job, their role is a service role. They need to serve their people. So it's almost an inverted pyramid and they're right at the bottom of that pile. Because if, they're not, if they don't understand their people, if they don't give trust, if they don't empower and develop their people, then that drives that command and control strategy, which generally doesn't work where you need to be highly adaptable, where you need to come up with creative solutions. So they tend to recruit in their own image only weaker. And they rely on what they're familiar with, and they don't brook any challenge. And so all the best leaders that I've interviewed, that I've come across, that I've worked for, have incredibly high levels of humility. They play an infinite game. Their objective is to keep the game going and make the pie bigger, as opposed to take a bigger piece of a shrinking pie and either play to win or play not to lose, which is an incredibly depressing, boring place to work. And what they also do is they encourage diverse opinion. They encourage people to take risks because what they don't ever do is they don't punish risk taking. They punish hiding failure. So I'm really curious again to understand if, if you look at the best leaders that you've had the pleasure of working with, what were their innate qualities and what's it like when you meet them to be on the receiving end of that conversation? You know, first of all, just a very quick comment on what you said, because you, you nailed it, Max. I mean, what you really don't want at the end of the day is having around you the, what I call the yes men. Yeah. The people that are gonna, they're going to tell you yes, 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 just because they're afraid of what might happen if they say no, isn't it? And then maybe we can come back to this because it, it's all about culture. Because then, you know, if one individual, but how can you develop in a culture that allow people to thrive, to be empowered, and not actually to be blamed? So it's, it's such a great point. So back to your question, I'll tell you what, there's something interesting, Marcus. I can, you know, freely say that the majority of leaders I work with, they haven't been great. They haven't been great, to be honest. Because... That's probably one of the reasons why, you know, I do what I do. It's just the fact that I don't have big experience. And if you ask actually people around, it's interesting. And most of the people are going to tell you, if you ask the question, did you have a good boss in your career? I'm pretty sure that most of the people are going to say no. For the majority of my time, probably not. So that's something there, really. But I remember very well when I worked actually in, uh, in Egypt. So I spent five years in Egypt for I was working, working there at the time. And actually had three different bosses during the five years. So one of them has been just awesome, amazing. And you know why, Marcus? Because he was supportive. He was, he was never directed in a way to approach me. And because there was a, such a level of trust, you know, we're always coming back to trust, isn't it? So you know what? I felt uh, it was safe. It was safe for me to open up and ask sometimes even just very stupid question. And sometimes you don't ask when you feel there is a judgment, right, from the other side of the table. I think that is important because when you're, you know, not only when you're a leader, but also when you're growing as an individual, you have a lot of stupid questions to ask. A lot about your work, <laughs> about procedures, about systems, about processes, just because you're learning, you know, and especially in my industry, the energy is interesting in this because it's not something that you learn on the book, actually you're learning by doing. So that, that's a strategy, if you like, in the oil and gas industry, or at least has been for many years. So, you, you know, they, 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 they put you in a position, say, you know what, either you thrive or, or survive, 
or or not. So that's exactly the other. You don't have really options. So so there are a lot of stupid questions during that process. But I remember that boss had this such a very high level of trust, and instead of say, hey, Andre, you have to do this thinking this way, or you have to do this in that way, or don't do this, or don't do that. It was actually supporting me in any decision I was making. So one, I think a couple of things I remember well was one approach when he used to say, hey, Andrea, I'm not sure. I have an idea, but you take a decision. If you fail, that is the right decision. Either you take it or go back to your thinking process and see what, what else you need in order to form the final decision. I love that. That, for me, is the best approach possible to spark, as you say, to spark creativity, innovation, and strategic thinking. And the other question they used to say is, how can I help you? Instead of saying, Absolutely. how can I help you to achieve what you want to achieve? For me, this is everything. So a great manager is going to be different from a great leader. What are the qualities and what are the different functions of a manager versus a leader? Well, uh, I've seen, I don't know, many articles, a conversation about the difference between a manager and a leader. It's interesting because everyone has a different opinion, right? And so, so for me, I think that the major difference is the fact that a leader shouldn't necessarily manage day by day, manage what's going on with people. It's actually leading people to be a better version of themselves. That's for me the difference. The problem is that many leaders, they tend, unfortunately, to fall into the management role so, and that's when they start to micromanage people. And that is, as you know, Marcus, is the worst way actually to motivate people. Because as soon as you get micromanaged, you're going to disengage 100% with the business, right? Well, you, you can't motivate anyone to do anything ever because motivation is an internal force, but you can demotivate with that behavior. Totally right. Totally right. So that is, for me, is the main thing. As we said at the beginning, I'm sure that you've experienced too. How many times you have seen managers, right? That we, you know, they, they've been promoted, but they keep doing what they were doing before. They keep managing. It's, it's like salespeople <laughs> get promoted into management. They keep selling, exactly and they, right. they forget the real job, or it becomes a, an inconvenient afterthought. Oh, I'm too busy to manage. Of course you are, because <laughs> you're an. But idiot. you guess what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but also because that's the comfort zone, isn't it? That's a comfort zone. They've been good in that. And for them, it's actually a bigger stretch moving into leadership role. It's much safer for them, at least in their mind, to keep doing what they were doing because they, they thought they were good on that. Okay, so this is a really difficult question. And sorry for putting you on the spot on this one. What does the apprenticeship for leadership need to look like? To become a leader. So what you have to do to become a leader. In the runway. The apprenticeship from producer into manager and then learning how to be a leader whilst you are a manager so that when you move into the job, you're equipped. I'm curious about what that should look like in your mind. It's not as difficult as you, as you think because it, it really depends. So there are three or four things that you have to do it. Do it. Now, either, either you do it alone or with a coach or someone, that doesn't matter. But first is really start thinking of managing, not anymore managing up, but start managing down. In other words, is how can I get the most out of my team and stop really stepping into, into the roles? Now, maybe you're still a manager. You're still managing day by day. But you know what you have to do is start changing your mindset and start thinking, OK, I can keep doing what I'm doing right now. But the reality is I, start, I need to start to change my mindset first and think as a leader, regardless of what I'm doing right now. So there is a mindset element. The second are some typical behaviors. So first, you have to change your communication style. Because the communication style that you've been using as a manager is going to be different than the communication style you're going to use as a leader. For a simple reason, as a manager, you're giving more instructions to people. You're giving tasks, right? As a leader, you're going to talk more about the vision, why we're doing what we're doing. And you have to embrace different leadership, sorry, influence style or communication styles as a leader. They're not necessarily required as a manager. So what you have to do is really learning different styles of influence, communication, because that is key. So these are already, I think, a couple of things. And then I think is there is an element of confidence, because as a manager, you can be a very confident manager. But when it comes to leadership, 
in my experience, you require a different level of confidence too. Because when, you, when you're guiding people towards a vision, the level of confidence of yourself, your capability to do that, has to be higher than the confidence that you have as a manager. So it, it, the scope is different. So, so that's something that in my mind is, is important to consider. I'm going to challenge you on that because I've mm-hmm. come across several examples where the confidence comes from very high levels of humility and it's admitting you don't know what you're doing or that you're struggling with something and inviting others to participate. So a couple of people who spring to mind immediately are Michael Brody Wait. Michael was building an Inc. 500 fast track company. And at the time, they were 10 people. He just managed to get on the Oprah show or something like that. And all of a sudden, things went through the roof and he had no idea what he was doing. And he spent a couple of weeks in absolute turmoil, wondering what the hell he was going to do. And his breakthrough moment was where he had the team around the table and he said, you know, I'm a recovering drug addict. This is my second or third business. And in all honesty, I'm way out my depth. I have no idea what I'm doing. I need help. And it was that moment where he galvanized everybody to rally around. And they saw that act of courage, that act of vulnerability as a clarion call. And they ended up selling out to a publicly listed company for hundreds of millions. And that was hugely successful. Tom Shodorf, who took Splunk from 42 million to 1.3 billion. Interestingly enough, he was passed over for promotion into management for about seven years. And eventually he managed to get his break. And he just skyrocketed when he was in management because he was a fabulous manager. And then he grew into a fabulous leader. And what was really interesting was, uh, in fact, in both of their cases, their attitude towards learning, not training, but learning. They were absolutely open to learning. They are open to being coached. They have multiple coaches. Learning is central to their culture and the culture that they develop. And not knowing the answer is fine. But having the humility to invite help and take it is a key differentiator. And I can think of, now that I'm talking about it, I can think of another half a dozen uh, who are exactly the same. So whilst they need to have confidence and when they're selling the vision, absolutely, they don't need to be the finished article. And they don't need to, they, they don't need to be able to do the work. That's why they hire great people. You know, Steve Jobs made the point you know, about hiring people better than yourself. Now, he was a pretty big brain. And I'm sure <laughs> if you read Walter Isaacson's biography of him, working with him could be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, but he managed to generate some amazing accomplishments precisely because he got the best out of people. And one of my favorite questions as a leader and a manager is, is this your best work? It's a beautiful question. It's simple, but it's very difficult for someone to hide when it's not their best work. And then they start to take ownership of it. Because I think one of the things great leaders do is they establish incredibly high standards. And they recruit people who buy into those high standards and they hold each other to account. Your thoughts? 100%. And I mean, the the example that you gave, just just to clarify, the example are fantastic because you you mentioned about vulnerability, you know, lifetime learning. This is what the leaders are. These are lifetime learners because they want to challenge themselves. They think that it's never enough. And then I'm going to tell you something though on that because there is a, um, a caveat actually on having that approach to some extent because it sounds like you have that sense of urgency and you never feel accomplished. So from a personal perspective, it might be a little bit risky situation, not feeling that you are always ready for something. But we can come back to this if you want a little bit later. But just to, just to clarify, 
Confidence for me doesn't mean necessarily vulnerability. So you can have a high level of confidence, but still be very vulnerable with people and say openly that you're not, you're not enough. You need help. You need to get more support by others. Yeah, you still need to show to your people that you have the confidence you have the confidence enough actually to drive into a different situation. And that's what the leaders are doing. So combining and balancing confidence, vulnerability, I think is a, is a key because you don't want to as well look fully confident as an individual because people are not going to follow you. So there is an element of, of that of balance. So back to your point, I think that question is fantastic. That, that question is truly fantastic because there is an element, as you said, of ownership. And the ownership is, is something that you keep it for yourself or you give in ownership of the, your great results, your performance actually to your people. The best leaders, they, don't ne- they never feel that they are owner actually of the great results of the people. Sports is a great example, Mark. Isn't it? If, you know, all the football fans say that when you, when you hear that the coaches say when they win it, Oh, that's thanks to the team. You know, the teams have done it. Don't, don't, don't say, don't thank me because, you know, I just put everything together. In reality, we know that's not right, right? However, that's what the ownership, the real, and the, sorry, the real leadership uh, is, is about, is giving ownership of success to your team. Sometimes you see leaders say, I did this. I built this. I led my organization from where they were to seven figures, eight figures, whatever. And that is a very poor sign of leadership because you are essentially discounting the value of your team having, you know, really help you to achieve what you achieve. So ownership, I think, is a big thing. It's a good way to actually measure the type of leader that is in front of you, the level of ownership they take. Okay. So this then raises the next question around leadership and recruitment. In terms of building the, uh, the team around you as a leader, what advice would you give to, let's say, a new CEO or a founder in terms of building the right team? Great question. And uh, the starting point uh, is having full clarity of what the skills that you really need. It sounds obvious, but it's not. Because... There are so many bias. That's why I think you said you know, it could be racist because there are so many bias in the recruitment process. So people, unfortunately, recruit for the wrong reason. They recruit because they want to have people like them, as you mentioned before. And that's the biggest mistake you can, you can ever make. Yeah. Because actually you need to get people that, you know, they're complementary what you actually, what you are not, what you don't have. And that is really the main thing. The second thing is really have, highlighting super well what the results you want your people to achieve. Not necessarily what you need right now, because if you're leading an organization to somewhere else, as you're supposed to do, most likely you need a different set of skills in your organization. Because if you are actually planning or framing the skills that you need right now, you may be blindsided, actually, because the, 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 the real skills is something that you need in the future. And I think, uh, unfortunately, I see many organizations, because they are really short view about their future. They think about what they need right now because they maybe they need to increase profit or revenues because they're in a terrible situation. And they all, you know, well, I need a sales manager or I need uh, someone that can do a better marketing. Or maybe I need an engineer that does this thing. When the reality is, if you don't have a clarity of what you really, where you want to bring the organization, so then it's going to be difficult and there's all kinds of skills that you need in the future. There is a lot of conversation right now. I'm sure that you, you have seen this in terms of what, are the, what is the future of work? So what are the skills that we probably need in 2030? That is a typical conversation that's going on on YouTube and other social media platforms. No one knows, right? No one knows what's going to happen in 2030, given all the uncertainty that we have right now. But clearly, if you don't have an idea where you want to bring your organization in the future, Whatever how you're going to make is going to be wrong. That's my idea on that. That future planning and perspective is really key. I worked with a company that probably half a decade or a decade ago, and what they would do is future planning with navies and military. And what was really interesting was um, being able to see that far into the future on the basis of who you're recruiting today And we're seeing that there's a huge problem coming up. There was a report in Forbes that I read uh, earlier today 
that 41% of employees around the, the developed world are considering a career change this year. There you go. Now, let that sink in for a minute, if you're a leader, because if you were to lose 41% of your staff today, maybe it wouldn't make a whole heap of difference, but for many of you, it probably would, and it would screw up your vision and the execution of that vision. But with this organization, they were looking at, for example, navies. If you don't have enough nuclear scientists today, in 15 years' time, when they can be running a submarine, you're not going to have people to be able to run the submarine. So you're going to have this billion-dollar piece of kit just sat on dockside simply because you don't have the staff. And you've got to really think ahead. So I think what vis uh, leaders are, are, they're visionary, and they're able to think ahead in terms of the business that we're going to become or the organization we're going to become in three years, five years' time, and plan for that. What are the roles and positions that we're going to need to fulfill our obligations to our customers in five years' time, in three years' time, in two years' time, Not a year, six that. months, three months? For that to be possible, what are the budgets that we have to have available? So for us to be able to afford to hire those people, what do we have to sell? How many customers do we need? They need to also identify the trigger point when we start recruiting, because if you recruit reactively, you're only ever going to have the compromise candidate that was available at the time. So they need to have that big picture and they need to surround themselves with the right kind of people to challenge their thinking. And this is where I think the, the whole topic of diversity is really important. Diversity is not just about gender or age an ethnic background. It's about socioeconomics. It's about disciplines. And I think it's really important, and certainly from my conversations with Tom Shodorf, they would have stand-up fights behind closed doors, but they would have stand-up fights, but then they would agree a course of action and everybody would then back it. But ultimately, it was his decision if the team couldn't reach a conclusion. And yeah. then he would have to live by that decision. And that takes a lot of courage when you're, you know, you're seeing a business that's growing 200% per annum compound. That's a scary place to be because now what you've got to be able to do is manage the expectations of people who joined the business and six months later, it's totally different. And six months later, again, it's totally different. So being able to handle that level of pace and change is really key for great leaders. Yes, Marcus, and you hit the nail here, because there is an element that for me is important uh, on the recruitment process for any organization, regardless where you're going, is a very high level of flexibility of people. For exactly the same reason that you just mentioned. Because organizations are changing in a super fast pace, but it's not their fault necessarily. It's not just because they have a new CEO that are changing the, you know, their, their, their vision every single time. It might be for that reason, but most of the time, just because the market dynamics are forcing them to keep changing the strategy, which is not good, of course. But what I can say is flexibility, adaptivity, adaptivity is the really skill for the future, for any organization. Do you really want to stop thinking about hiring people that are very rigid in their approach in a way? So that's one, one thing I would like to share. And the other thing that for me is super important is, and that is an interesting challenge. I'm really interested to hear what you think on this, Marcus. The average tenure of a CEOs right now, it's about three, five years, probably even probably even less than that. Maybe, you know, let's say two, three to play safe. And for this reason, unfortunately, they, most of them, they tend to, again, to play safe. What that means is they're not taking calculated or worries for organization. They're not making big changes. They're not driving super interesting strategies. Why? Because maybe, you know, if the tenure is so low, one of the questions that the afternoon said, I'm not saying right, I'm just strong, but that's unfortunately what happens is, should I really do that? Should I, have, you know, should I, have, should I make all these changes one, if I know that I'm going to leave the company actually sooner than I, than I think? And that's going to be risky, I think, for organization. Well, I think there is a really interesting parallel in politics. Most yes. prime ministers and most presidents are thinking by the end of their second year, 
about re-election. And I think there is a real plus to only having one term. And if you've only got two to five years, if that's the only time you have, that's the time to be decisive, to really engage for impact, to be proactive and adaptive, and to take risk. And I would love to see our politicians and our leaders only having one term for that mm. reason. Because I think if they weren't worrying about re-election and they only had one shot at it, then they would do much better work. CEOs see it that they only have a short tenure and they're more worried about their next job than they are about this one. It's like me playing golf. If I'm uh, worrying about my last shot or my next shot, this shot will be shit. So I have to think about where I am and where the ball lands, that's where I have to play from. So I have to accept what is and change what I can, which is my behavior. And I think in leadership, we also have to adopt that mentality, which is where are we at the moment? What resources do we have available to us? And what choices can we make? And then try to make the best choice, the best decisions with the resources and people that we have at the moment. But we also have to have that long-term view, which is how can I steer as straight a course as possible to get there, whilst also recognizing that my plan is likely to be out of date the moment I press print and publish it. The Buddhist monks have a lovely exercise where for 10 minutes they argue for the existence of God and someone argues against it, and then they swap roles. And right. I think leaders need to be able to accept and understand an opposing perspective without necessarily agreeing with it, but invite it in order that it can challenge and smooth off the edges of their own thinking. And this comes back to the team. I think having a team made up of a balance of different skills, different disciplines, different personality types, and bringing them all together, empowering them to take risks, to offer up ideas without being shot down, then reaching a conclusion either through consensus or through reasoned debate allows yes. leaders to come up with much better outcomes. And I think there's one other thing that's missing, which is that most strategy is far too complex, far too complicated rather than complex. In my experience, great strategy is simple. And it's about picking three to eight big bets over the next three years, built on understanding real insight into your customer and the journey that they go through. If you build a business from there and you build your strategy from there with, let's say, five major bets that you're working on over the next three years and clear milestones and clear definable, deliverable milestones at the six-month point that you hit because you've got the right people leading those work streams, as opposed to because of their job title, they're the best person for the job. And often that's someone who's an operator, not someone with the, uh, the big job title. And if you hit that six-month milestone, then the rest of the organization views the strategy as credible. And then you start getting everybody else on board. 100% Marcus. And it's funny that you mentioned that because that's really strategic planning in, in a very effective way. Because I do a lot of work with CEOs actually strategic planning. And my approach is exactly as you described. Because I've seen, I'm sure that you did it, you did too, strategy plan for five, six years. That's completely ridiculous. As you mentioned, two, even probably two years' time, in two years' time, the strategy will, will probably change anyway because the market is so dynamic for the uncertainty that we mentioned. So there's no point to do you know, all this incredible strategy plan for five years and you guess what? Well, they ended up on the shelf anyway because no one is using anyway. They're not a practical. As you do, in my work, for example, what we do with leaders, we identify only three or five maximum key strategic priorities. That's it. But once we did a lot of exercise, by essentially answering three questions is about the clients first, 
about the competition first and then about the market. So these are the three things, the three th- and sorry, and the product, which is even poor, product or service. These are the three things that you really need to ask yourself. What are the clients are looking for in the future? What is your competitor are looking in the future? So you can actually be them in advance by preparation. And third, what is going to be your product, your service in the future? And these are, uh, you know, out of the strategic brainstorming, et cetera, you need to end it up with a very small number of key strategic priorities because these are the things that you're going to implement it. Because one of the major things that we also we need to remember is one of the major problems in the society, but in particular in the business world, is a very lack of execution. A lot of great strategies, but there is no execution there. Implementation is one of the, the, the big problems here. So it's even pointless actually having five or 10 different strategic initiatives because you know you're not going to implement it anyway. So why even do that? Taking three or four, but the, the one that's going to make a difference to your business. Well, this is really where I think there is a distinct lack of awareness about the vagueness of management and leadership language. Accountability is touted around by so many people, but actually it's really vague. What are you going to be responsible for? And there's a difference between accountability and responsibility. Are you reliable? Do you say you uh, do you do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it to the standard you committed to? Are you effective? Are you getting the results that we intended? So you talk about communication earlier. It's really key that you have to be clear, specific, certain in your communication. Because ambiguity is the mother of all fuck-ups. If you want confusion, disappointment, mismatched expectations, be unclear, be vague. So at the risk of speaking ill of the dead, if you listen to Boris Johnson, the total lack of any clarity means that he's surrounded by a bunch of people who will end up doing what they think they should do. Because I'm sure that I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that I'm not a fan that you know, they're doing their best, but they don't have any clarity or direction. And yeah. uh, again, this is really where leaders need to be the standard bearer. They need to be the totem around which the rest of us rally. And I think that's a huge uh, shortfall or deficiency in many leaders because they are indecisive. They're ambiguous. They are not committed to a particular course of action. They're not willing to take responsibility. So then they create this culture of blame, excuse making, upward delegation, they become a bottleneck and the organization gets paralyzed. And this is why I think the single biggest force in many organizations, particularly larger ones, because as they were getting large, they were dynamic and forthright and they had clarity. But then inertia sets in, and inertia is effectively just a slow, painful death. And you look at all the companies who were on the Fortune 500 or the FTSE 350 20, 30 years ago, there's only a fraction of them there now. And I think it's inertia that drives that. And I'd be really curious to see. I mean, one of the missions of the companies I'm working with is that our clients will dominate the FTSE 350 and the Fortune 500. It's not about us. It's about helping our clients get there and then stay there. And that's a really exciting vision. Because, I mean, I just get a thrill up my spine at the thought of it. (laughs) Help me understand this then. So many organizations are led by people who think that they can bribe performance out of their staff. Why Mm. is that so wrong? That's actually when the neuroscience kicks in, because we're, we're scientists, and I'm glad actually to mention that because that's part of my work, actually, is building intrinsic motivation. I actually explain to organizations that intrinsic motivation would they work to some extent. And it has been an assumption that, you know, pay more money to people is the only way, the best way, actually, to get the most of your people. And that is just wrong. But before we knew it from a personal experience or from statistics, now we know it as well from a neuroscience standpoint. 
So what the neurosciences actually have realized uh, is that there is a limit until the extrinsic motivation can really work. And in the US, they, they actually, they, they identified the threshold. It's just, I think it's like something like $75,000. So that is a threshold. So until that point, because then, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, Maslow's pyramid of needs, because that is what it's all about. So people that want to be safe first, and then when they're safe, then they go to the next level of, of needs, right? Now, think about bribing people and giving more money, more benefits to get the most out of them in motivation is just wrong. Motivation is something that we build as a person. It's a self-motivation. So the key for leaders is not really focus on monetary rewards, but building other rewards that can have the self-motivation to be built. So it's a, it's a very different paradigm. It's a paradigm shift. But yeah. very few organizations think about that. They think, oh, I'm not getting great performance probably either these are the, the not right people for me, or I need to give them more money, I need to give more benefit, et cetera, et cetera. No, what the neuroscience says, says is we need to be more passionate, more giving them vision, giving the purpose, giving the grit, and building their persistence, and giving their also master their skills. And most importantly, Marcos, is autonomy. Back to the point that we were saying about micromanagement, right? Autonomy is the number one or maybe two most important factors actually to build intrinsic motivation on people. I've, I've been blessed um, because throughout my career, barring a couple of crappy jobs at the beginning, I've loved everything that I've ever done. So work has become play. But the last 15, 16 years when I realized where my strengths lie and restructured all of my work around that. Now, being self-employed, that's a lot easier for me to do. However, my advice to managers who wish to be great and leaders who wish to be great is find the work that encourages the individual's soul to sing and have them do more of it and have them do... Because I believe our job is to hire fabulous people. And let's be honest, not everyone is fabulous in all uh, walks of life, but there are many fabulous people out there. Once you've hired fabulous people, then get the best out of them. Give them trust. Give them the coaching and the support that they need. Uh, Provide them with the resources for them to learn. Provide them with the tools and equipment and everything they need to do their best work every day. Give them masses of encouragement and encourage them to fail and learn from that failure. Encourage them to collaborate and hire people who are not brittle. Hire people are always asking who is the best person for this uh, role, willing to let go. So again, I think I fundamentally believe that ego at its in in its worst qualities is uh, among the most divisive and dangerous qualities any uh, anyone can possess but particularly a leader because they create the conditions for drama which means that people will be defensive they will make excuses bias prejudice noise will creep in and i think the best leaders that i know of are the ones who are constantly questioning their traditions, they're constantly reviewing their processes, their policies. And you touched on something earlier on, which I uh, meant to pick up on, but uh, I've now remembered, which is leaders need to be very careful what they say, what they do, what they approve of, because it's very easy for other people to read that as direction, and then it suddenly becomes policy. And the unintended consequence of a leader stating maybe a passing opinion is often extremely dangerous. Marcus, as I always say, the first thing a leader should always remember is they are watched and listened all over the time. So they have to be the message. They are the message every single day, every single hour, with every single gesture they, they take from an email sent to a way how they say hello to the people, to the way how they conduct a meeting, and just to the way how they walk around. Now it's not anymore. Fortunately, it's not a big deal because it's COVID, but at some point they need to walk again in the corridors. And that's, that's very important. Be the message. Be consistent 
with yourself in what you say, because otherwise you're going to fail in dramatically, actually, because consistency from a, for a leader is everything. And I think I would like to say, just to add it to your fantastic list that you share, one thing that for me is also very important, especially for a new generation, is the fact that if you don't give them a purpose, it's not going to work in the future markets because the new generation are looking for purpose. So well, my age, your age, maybe was different, but now it's not working anymore. E even that I have to challenge because when, you, uh, when old fossils like me come along and uh, yeah. they find a purpose, you drive so much more. I left yeah. my old business in October 2020 and I had purpose before, but I was released from uh, certain constraints in terms of territory and the things that I could do. And so I have four really huge goals, and that's something else. I think goal setting should be about creating big, hairy-assed, audacious, challenging, impossible goals. So my first goal is to take eight companies in the 10 to 50 million range to a billion dollars revenue, make them profitable, build them on strong fundamentals, without taking investment or going into debt and turn them into destination employers. So Love eight it. companies over eight years. I want to transform the way marketing is done and get it away from this data monkey stuff that just doesn't work. I mean, you look at the 4.8 quadrillion adverts that are inflicted on you and I every year that get one click or none. Uh, you look at the ineffectiveness of email marketing, you look at the ineffectiveness of telemarketing. So I want to break the back of that and drive effectiveness and efficiency and relevance into that. I want to break the back of the investment community. I think most investors are nothing better than speculators and gamblers and shysters. And the minute they come into a company, most of them taint and poison the culture, and they move them away from being obsessed about the customer to being obsessed about new logo acquisition, growth, and an exit. And that short-term thinking creates short-term results and long-term unintended consequences, whereas long-term thinking, long-term behavior, and deliver short-term results, medium-term results, and long-term results. And that's all about being collaborative. And I think our future success will be determined by our ability to collaborate internally with the customer, with our partners, and with our competitors. And then the fourth is to turn sales into a force for good. It's a genuinely noble profession when executed well. It's a horrifying taint on humanity when it isn't. Then the fifth one, which is make our clients the dominant force in the global market, um, helping them to grow, but to do so ethically with the customer at the heart being destination employers where people are queuing up to join them and where the brightest minds want to work because they have genuine purpose and it's fit for purpose. Now, those five things mean that Monday cannot come around fast enough and Friday happens too fast every single week. <laughs> Love it. I love it. Just love it what you just shared. That's really purpose. And then it's great because actually you you break down the purpose into a specific, specific goal. And I think one thing that you mentioned, Mark, that I love it, is the fact that you mentioned about impossible goals. I always say that's actually something that, looking back to my, when I was a little bit younger, I think at that time, when I was in my 20, my early 30s, Maybe I was playing safe as well when it comes to setting goals. I was probably thinking about good goals, but not too big goals. Because I thought, well, that is going to be difficult for me. And there was a limiting belief that I created myself. Now, for me, as change completely, and that's what I do as well with clients, is actually the first thing to do, once you have a great purpose, is setting big goals. These are goals that you need. They have to be big, because if they're big, they're going to force you actually a lot of inspiration, motivation, energy, passion, great, uh, resilience, actually, to get to the, to, the, to the goal. You have to reach big goals. The organization as well sometimes play too safe. And the other thing it does, I've noticed, is it attracts other people. 
Yes. None of that is possible with me on my own. You know, we're building a global community called Sales of Force for Good. The companies that I'm working with are all driving towards um, those objectives of serving the customer. Uh, we're becoming so customer obsessed and hyper collaborative, and we're constantly challenging ourselves. And the ideas are starting to really flow. What I'm looking for at the moment is uh, an investment fund that buys into that vision and is willing to take the risk because I'm convinced on the basis that I've worked with hundreds of companies over the years and I've yet to find one where I cannot find 400% growth within the first couple of hours. It's there, it's latent within the business and they're struggling with 10 or 12%. So I wanna work with a fund that will let us play with their entire portfolio and help them raise the bar so that 50, 70, 80% of them reach IPO, trade sale, or exit, and everybody wins. The investors walk out with a massive cash pile. The fund managers walk out being the heroes of the marketplace, and all those companies provide employment, sustainable employment. It's just beautiful. But what's really fascinating is the number of people who are buying into the vision with me. And I'm so excited about it. I'm very grateful for it as well, because I'm learning so much from them. Look, uh, Andrea, sadly, we've come to the top of the hour. Tell me this. You have a golden ticket, and you can go back and advise the idiot Andrea, age 23. What one bit of advice would you give him? Well, what I think, the thing I just said probably you know, a few minutes ago is really dream big. Dream big and think about big, because we can all make it. So that's one thing. The second thing, I think, is believe more in yourself. Because, you know, we nowadays have seen so many people losing their confidence on themselves and the situation is not helping, honestly. You know, we have to face the truth. But we need to believe in ourselves and stop really having these terrible bad thoughts in our mind because they become some poor limiting beliefs. So in the limiting belief, they become perception, becomes, then become habit, unfortunately. So there is all this vicious cycle that has to be broken. So my suggestion is really that is, Believe more in yourself because we can do it with the right support, with the right skills, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, from a more, let's say, technical, tactical perspective, one of my experience that I probably I would like to share with the, with the audience is learn to become more generous. Because when I was younger, yeah. I thought that this specialty was probably the key to build a career, to, to build a journey, to become a leader. And I'm so glad in my 30s, I stopped the idea of being specialist and become more generalist. So, you know, I changed roles. I became a director of sales and marketing for many years, and I never worked in sales, you know, in the early in my career, but I tested myself. I tried many different things, different industry, different roles. And honestly, right now, I can't say how good was that for, for my career, for my development. And I, I, I believe the specialism is not the future. Generalism is the future to be a, be, to be a great leader. I agree. I think, in fact, uh, David Epstein's book, Range, is a fabulous yes. book. But as a business, I think you need to hyper-specialize. But as a leader, you need to generalize. And you exactly. need to build a diverse team of experts in different fields. But as a leader, if you want to lead, I've worked in 500 different market segments over the last 20 years. And I'm able to draw on the experience I had with a matchmaking firm, which is basically headhunting. Uh, we took them from an average order value of £1,200 to £36,000 in four weeks. We cut their sales cycle down from three months to two weeks. And drawing on that experience, applying that in recruitment, applying what I've learned in recruitment in IT, the stuff I've learned in IT, in defense, and so on. And with that breadth of experience, you can connect the dots. It's a, a skill called ideation, but it's a particularly powerful and useful resource for leaders because if you can join the dots, then you can also ask the question, who? Who knows how to do this? Where else have they done this? And who is the person best placed to help us? Uh, and take advice from different industries. Don't just stick with people from your own industry. And in recruitment, a pal of mine, Patrick Lindquist, was running a project to revitalize uh, transport in Sweden. 
And he hired a team of 10 people, none of whom had ever worked in transport. Every one of them was a user of transport. And mm-hmm. they told him he was mad, but he actually managed to achieve, overachieve against all the goals and objectives. What books would you recommend people uh, read in order to improve their leadership capacity or to build their apprenticeship in leadership? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question because I read, I'm on a mission actually to read one book per week. And uh, so far, I've been on schedule, which is challenging, you know, in your daily work. But uh, yes. So for me, I think the number one book actually is a book that I know I don't only suggest, but when I work with people at the individual level, I essentially ask them to buy before I actually we start working together. So it's really the Atomic Habits from James Clear. And that series has been a best-selling book, so, but because it has been able to, to practically define how to build very high-performing habits or how to break bad habits. And honestly, habits is everything matters. Because, you know, having a great habit, it's the best way to build your performance as a, as a leader, as an individual, not just as a leader. So habit is important. So the atomic habit is number one. Probably number two is actually The Act of Impossible by Stephen Kotler. And that is a book I recommend to everyone because it's amazing to reach sustainable high peak performance in business, in life, in sport. Because I work in high performance. And he embraced neuro, he's a neuroscientist, so I'm a neuroscience coach too. So for me, neuroscience is the future, but also is the present, how I apply science in developing leaders. So these are the number two. And then that all the Patrick Lencioni books are just yeah. put on. So. Absolutely. Anything by Patrick Lencioni is a must read. Exactly. And, exactly. and Stephen Kotler also wrote, uh, wrote a fabulous book called The Rise of Superman, Superman um, yes. which is fantastic. Excellent. Okay. So how can people get hold of you, Andrea? Yeah, many ways. So I think the easiest is certainly the, my website, so andreapetrone.com. So that's where there is, you know, a little bit more about me and what I do, my, my services to organizations and to individuals. And then certainly LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, I'm very active. We met Marcos on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is where I spend most of my time, commenting others and engaging with posts. And then, of course, I'm you can find me on Twitter. That, that's also my, my platform. And then Clubhouse, but I don't know many, many people that are using Clubhouse, but I'm, I'm quite active on Clubhouse. But these are the, let's say, the main thing. Of course, email if they want to contact me directly, Andrea at andreapetroni.com. Excellent. Andrea Petroni, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for your time. It's been great. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this insightful, useful, challenging, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And please share it with somebody who is a leader or an aspiring leader who would benefit from the ideas contained in this conversation. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. And if you want to get hold of me, email me, marcus at last.com or direct message me on LinkedIn. Stay safe. Bye-bye.